Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Vladimir Strezov. I'm uh, based in Sydney, Australia, um, a professor at the School of Natural Sciences. I'm a professor in, in environmental sciences at the Faculty of Science and Engineering at Macquarie University. And I would like to thank you for this invitation to participate to the webinar. Um, I will uh, talk about bioenergy and biomass and around a work that we have been doing for quite some time now and um, just the role of biomass it can um, have on um, the sustainable development and sustainable energy. So the outline of the presentation, and I should mention that if uh, someone is interested to find out more about um, the topic, uh, we have uh, two books that are related to uh, this area. So um, this uh, just a snapshot of the two books. But the outline is going to be around energy and sustainability, uh, biomass, what it is, what the properties are. And I will um, discuss the uh, system solutions <clears throat> and uh, designing engineering uh, systems to uh, the application of biomass in the circular economy and in the, in the sustainable development. So first <clears throat> is how do we divide biomass? So this is a busy table, but the way what we propose is um, to have a dimension, two-dimensional look at how we present uh, what is biomass. So the first dimension is the biological origin. And this is what you would find typically in the literature is what is biomass, whether it's derived from plants, animals, or even we humans produce biomass through the uh, wastewater and sewage treatment process. <clears throat> but then the plants, whether they are terrestrial, they're, whether they are aquatic, and then if they are aquatic, whether they're freshwater, saltwater, um, and the animals we have mainly in the form of tallow and, and manure. So that's um, what has been um, presented in the literature. But what we say is also it is very important how the biomass is harvested. What is the production route? And this is really the importance for, from the point of view of sustainability, whether it's a accidental biomass, whether it's a waste residues, whether it's a cultivated energy crop, or it is harvested from nature. And then again, we can look at weeds uh, that we really want to uh, remove, uh, agricultural waste, forest waste, industrial waste, or if it's energy crops, then how often do they grow, what type of soil they would need, and uh, with the natural biomass, whether it's replanted or, or it is removed. So if we look at the energy supply, um, the uh, most recent publication shows that we are still primarily dependent on Fossil fuels, so oil we see 29%, coal 26%, natural gas 23%. What we do see is that previously hydropower was um, the, the largest uh, renewable energy source, but now uh, biomass we see that it is, has overtaken, so over 10% of the renewable energy comes from biomass and bioenergy, so 10.5%. And what we see is that the modern, modern bioenergy is now taking um, over with 6.4%, and by modern, that means more energy efficient with um, energy recovery options. So we will look at uh, how the, the energy uh, sources, the primary energy supply changes with time. Uh, we can see that biofuels and waste increase. They have increased in the last six years. Uh, we also see that coal, oil, um, uh, they have a tendency to decline 
and especially 2020. So we will see whether this is the effect of the um, the COVID lockdowns or uh, it is actually a trend that follows the uh, pressure to achieve sustainability. So, so the next year or two would be an interesting one just to confirm the trends of the decline in the fossil fuels. So um, first, the question is, what is energy and sustainability? And this is something that is of my interest um, for research. I um, We do work on um, sustainability and measuring sustainability, especially um, energy uh, production. Can energy production play a positive role in sustainability? And if it can, then um, how it can be done. So first, what is energy and sustainability? First, it's preserving the resources. So we have the minerals underground. Fresh water is can also deplete if we consume or pollute at a faster rate than what it can um, regenerate or refresh. And the agricultural land as well, um, we do see decline in agricultural land, especially as we convert the land to more of the um, you know land affected by salinity or uh, or depleting quality. And um, what we want is we want the minerals to be there for our future generations. In case of coal, for instance, once we consume, we combust, um, we don't live any for the future generations. So the next is preserving the environment. So we want to produce electricity. We want to um, um, to have reliable energy sources, but in a way that we can we prevent the environment. And by the environment, this is greenhouse gas emissions are uh, probably the primary focus at the moment, but there are other pollutants as well. So we don't want to um, preserve or reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, but then uh, increase pollution of other types of pollutants. So, um, so we want to preserve all um, in, environmental impacts. And water pollution is is uh, one uh, one example. Uh, the waste generated. So, nuclear power is a good example. For instance, it can. Uh, Preserve well, it doesn't emit greenhouse gases uh, as much, but then the waste generated has uh, is causing other problems uh, that uh, uh, need to be dealt with. So, both the resources uh, and the environment we want to preserve, but we want to uh, live better. So, we want to improve, improve li uh, livability. Uh, so, the economic parameters we want to increase. The social impacts need to be improved and uh, generally better quality of life. So um, a general term of sustainability equation is would be what are the benefits from the source divided by the risks or the impacts. So we want to improve the benefits. We want to reduce the impacts and the risks where the risks are, are real ones, identified as a hazard plus perceived risks or uh, public opinion, which is the outrage. And this has been presented for and, and known for quite some time. So even if the uh, solution is, uh, a technological solution is uh, from the environmental point of view, from the hazard point of view, uh, perhaps perfect, if the public doesn't accept it, then we have a problem. So again, I will mention nuclear power and there's a resistance, especially here in Australia, uh, historically to uh, to build a nuclear power plant. So that needs to be taken into consideration as well. So what we did in our earlier study, which I will present because it was uh, quite influential at the time and it still seems to be uh, also used by uh, many academics and I'll, I'll present is that we've we've developed a number of parameters based on which 
Uh, we presented the sustainability of energy. So the parameters that we selected is cost of electricity, greenhouse gas emissions, availability of the resources and, and limit any limits of uh, the technologies, uh, efficiency of energy generation, land use. So for some countries, land use is very important. Uh, so I would say most of the countries in Asia, which are densely populated, land will be very important. For Australia, perhaps not so, because we have uh, plenty of land inland, I would say, uh, that is has lower density population. But for Australia, water consumption is important. So uh, because it is a dry continent, so water is another parameter. And social impact, social acceptability is another one. So we've collected these uh, parameters for each energy, energy generation technology using literature. And uh, we uh, used a multi-criteria assessment uh, type uh, for to evaluate with which of the technologies is, is the most sustainable. Um, but first, let's have a look at the costs of the electricity generation. So I'll present two figures. One is the original work that we did in 2009 and the most recent one. And we'll just see the differences uh, which are very clear. So back then, coal and gas were the cheapest options. Not only the cheapest, but also if we see, uh, for instance, the uh, the difference in the price is very narrow. Comparing to the renewable energy solutions and technologies, which uh, were back at that time more expensive, but not only that, they actually the variation is so large that just shows that they were not as reliable as uh, in terms of the economics uh, for the investors to um, to invest in these technologies. But um, twelve years later, we see different type of uh, scenarios. So this is the range and the medium. So what we see is, for instance, solar, uh, wind, hydro uh, being much cheaper than the coal, gas, and nuclear. Geothermal, very close. Biomass has a wide range. It can be um, competitive. And some of the other solar thermal is, is known to be expensive and, and offshore wind also. So we do see a significant difference in the trend in the price of the electricity in the years that we have been working on. And this is the reason why uh, we have seen increase in, uh, in renewable energy uptake around the world. So the greenhouse gas emissions is another parameter. Uh, what we see is the coal and gas having the largest greenhouse gas emissions, but all other renewable energy technologies also have uh, embedded or uh, greenhouse gas emissions mainly from construction of the plants, hydrants, for instance, from uh, the dams, uh, the, when the plants decay and emit uh, methane. Uh, biomass, we present two different ones. So dedicated energy crops is one, and the residues or the waste is the other. Uh, they are also showing differences in the CO2 emissions, mainly associated with agriculture, um, because to produce the dedicated energy crops, we actually have to cultivate them. Um, so the next, the next would be the reserves. So how much is is available? And the uh, BP, for instance, has annual reports where they are presenting their studies. So uh, we have been looking at these reports annually just to see whether the years of predicted consumption of the fossil fuels change. So that's this is a, a fairly recent um, report by BP showing 
coal, uh, 139 years. So it, what their prediction is that with the current coal deposits, known deposits, and the uh, rate of consumption of coal in 139 years, we will not be having any more coal. Oil and gas are much closer. So few, around 50 years for both. Um, but I have to say that I've been following up this review for quite some time now, and these numbers do not change very much. They change much slower than what the predictions are, mainly because um, the companies tend to find new deposits of oil, gas, and new deposits of coal. So uh, that's how the rate is actually much slower than what the predictions are. And uh, I would expect that uh, these uh, depletion years would actually be larger than what they're presented, but still they are, uh, from the sustainability point of view, they're still close uh, close enough to, to, to the presence. So uh, um, we're looking at one to two more generations uh, that, We'll, we'll be able to use these resources, which are very valuable, and we want more than one or two generations to have coal and oil and gas. So the next is water consumption <clears throat> and uh, land use, the footprint. And we see, for instance, with Barmet's dedicated energy crops, significant use of, of land and water. Nuclear power stations also need water. Um, as well as uh, the coal gas, res uh, the residues of the waste as well. <clears throat> so in terms of the land, biomass energy crops has the largest followed by, by hydro. And we conducted the survey uh, mainly locally <clears throat> based in Australia, uh, just to see what the public likes. The public likes uh, solar power quite a lot. So wind is also well, well accepted, but some of the renewable energy technologies are not really uh, well understood by the Australians, geothermal and biomass as well, uh, which means uh, that these energy sources would need uh, some type of uh, public awareness or education plans um, so that the public can understand what they are and accept them a little bit more. But mostly Australians wanted to see Australia moving away from coal and uh, and the country as a, as a coal-dominated country in production and use. This was uh, an interesting finding. So what we did back then, we used the multi-criteria to rank the technologies found that wind would rank most favorably using the uh, the uh, parameters that we've selected, followed by hydro. <clears throat> the interesting one was that energy crops were, uh, ranks the worst. So this means that we are better off using coal and, and nuclear and gas um, than to move into use of energy crops to uh, produce bioenergy. So uh, use of agricultural land, fertile soils to grow uh, plants that we would then burn to produce electricity or uh, convert to um, biodiesel or ethanol is, is from the sustainability point of view, not uh, the best solution. So um, some interesting findings from here is that combining, for instance, wind with hydro as well as PV here, uh, photovoltaics, makes sense. And using hydro uh, as pumped, uh, for instance, hydro uh, power stations as an energy storage is uh, something that came out from uh, this study um, as, as a, one of the solutions. So why not energy crops? Because of you know the food versus energy debate has been around. We see an image here from the uh, deforestation in Amazonia, so that uh, sugarcane can be planted, and we know that sugarcane is produced 
then converted to ethanol. Um, so that practice is one of those that we claim from the sustainability point of view is uh, actually worse than, than just using fossil fuels. And there was a report in UK, uh, for instance, that uh, back quite some time ago, that uh, feedstock production must be avoided, must avoid agricultural land that would otherwise be used for food production. And uh, that introduction, so this, the, the report said that the introduction of biofuels should be slowed until uh, solutions are found. Uh, so uh, what are the solutions? And we are presenting systems of solutions that uh, could uh, improve the sustainability standing of biomass. So uh, there are different routes of how biomass fuels can be uh, converted to uh, useful products, um, chemical, biochemical, or physical chemical productions. And the pro so the um, these processes end to production of electricity, steam, biofuels in in uh, the uh, forms of methane. Hydrogen, and the next presentation, I believe, is, is on uh, production of hydrogen using biomass, um, solid products, biochar, bios, and so on. So if we look at the, um, at the moment, the liquid products from biomass, we look at the first generation of, of biofuel production is using as we can see, most is what can be edible, such as cooking oils, converting cooking oils to biodiesel, sugarcane and corn, sugar beet to ethanol as well as wheat. So what we want, tallow is the only, uh, as we can see, tallow is the only uh, non-edible or let's say um, residue in this, this case. So we, we want to move into the second generation or even further, the third and fourth generation biofuels. And the second is using wastes or uh, lignocellulosic materials, which at the moment is a limitation of, of converting them to ethanol and, um, and biodiesel. So finding ways economical to, um, to better use these uh, sources. And the third generation is where we don't need land such as use of algae or uh, genetically modified crops that can grow into land that is unsuitable for uh, agricultural purposes. But even moving to the fourth generation, uh, fourth generation is um, producing carbon negative biomass. So producing these energy crops or a biomass uh, in a way that it can uh, reduce the greenhouse gas emissions or pollution or improve the soil quality. So I will I will talk about those types of systems that um, we can see the future of bioenergy will move. But first, let's look at the biofuel production. So this is some time ago, but just shows that biodiesel primarily depends on rapeseed oil, soybean oil, um, other fats and oils, but mainly uh, so from biodiesel, mainly it is from the edible oils. Um, the 11, 12 percent back at that time was was uh, fats and oils that were waste. So there's a larger contribution of of non edible or the waste for for production of biodiesel. While for ethanol, it was it is mainly coming from edible products. So. Um, Sugarcane, primary corn, sugar beet, and so on. Very little coming from corn stover, which is the waste. And if we look at the biofuel production, USA and Brazil um, are quite significant. Up Indonesia, China is is uh, fairly significant as well. Uh, only minor is down at the bottom uh, is Australia comparing to the rest of the countries. So one of the methods to um, to develop these systems of solutions is uh, a process paralysis process. So this is the some work that we've been working on. So biomass needs sun and CO2 to to uh, grow. Pyrolysis converts uh, biomass to biogas, bio oil, biochar, then the biogas can be combusted to drive the pyrolysis process. Uh, bio can be combusted for 
electricity, so that's the CO2 that is uh, coming back for biomass production. So it's a closed loop, uh, or it can be upgraded to biodiesel petrochemicals and the biochar can be used as a fertilizer or a solid fuel. But if it is used as a fertilizer, uh, because it's rich in carbon, it can sequester the carbon. So we produce electricity, uh, biodiesel, petrochemicals, while uh, achieving negative um, carbon emissions, so uh, sequestering carbon. So we looked at one very difficult um, waste product, which is paper sludge, and we have a capability to look at, well, how much energy does this paper sludge need to uh, to heat, to paralyze, and what's the point when it becomes energy positive? So we found that slightly 480 degrees from there on, up to 480, we need to add energy to paralyze the paper sludge. Above 480, it becomes energy positive, which means we can actually take uh, or create, generate electricity or energy from paper sludge, which is a difficult one. So um, to add energy, we can use solar power. So adding solar power or solar assisted biomass pyrolysis is another way what we have worked on. It means we can actually convert quite difficult biomass types, um, rich or uh, large in water moisture content to get the energy value out of them. So we worked in those, we have publications looking at um, chicken litter as uh, and some um, uh, wheat straw as, as types of uh, biomass. So the issue with the bio oil pyrolysis bio oil is that it's uh, very large in water. It is very large in oxygen, if we find, yeah, oxygen, and it has very low pH. So that makes it uh, unsuitable to, to uh, um, use in, in cars. It needs to be upgraded. Um, there are different ways of upgrading bio oils, and um, we have a paper summarizing all these technologies that are available. But the problem is, once you start adding these upgrading modules into uh, the process, the process becomes expensive. So what um, we try to do is design a biomass pyrolysis process that it can be catalytically in situ. So during that process, uh, upgraded with uh, re a reduced oxygen content, neutral um, in pH and low in, in moisture. So um, so that's, that's the work that we are currently doing. Um, but I'll also mention about the biochar and use of the biochar in um, agri for agricultural purposes. So that's known, uh, whoever works in, in the biomass area is aware of the benefits of biochar. It ha they have been known um, for a long time that adding carbon in the soil improves the quality of the soil. And so they are called terra preta soils found in Amazonian region where people have used uh, charcoal or biochar to create these very fertile soils because they improve the quality of the soils, water quality, capacity, soil erosion, and so on. So that's been well known. Um, and it is a way to actually not just sequester carbon, but improve quality of soils that are perhaps marginal or, uh, or uh, depleted. So what we looked is another type of biomass, and this is this from the wastewater treatment plant. And we look at um, and one anaerobic digestion here um, where uh, methane is released. And unfortunately, we don't really use um, anaerobic digestion of, of wastewater treatment plants very efficiently here in Australia. So the methane here is considered as a waste. It's, uh, it is flared. So at nighttime, you would see uh, a bright um, flame coming out of this stack. And this is 
Um, interestingly, an area in, uh, south of Sydney where there's a lot of um, call, a, a lot of uh, underground ground fracking uh, conducted to, to remove methane from the underground. So, um, so yes, so there's um, opportunity to to improve the sustainability of wastewater treatment plants in Australia because we have quite large unused electricity potential. Anyway, that's us. Uh, my student and uh, a colleague um, from uh, that wastewater treatment facility um, collecting sewage uh, sludge that we then uh, processed with pyrolysis and we use different types of uh, sewage from commercial, domestic, industrial origin, and looking at their quality, not uh, in energy efficiency in terms of converting them to uh, biochar, but also in nutrient nutrient retention potential. And then we cultivated so this is control without without uh, sludge biochar. This is with sludge biochar we cultivated. Uh, food crops, tomatoes in this case, but we also used energy, cultivation of energy crops with an assumption that we can use the biochar in a marginal soil to cultivate the energy crops. And we found um, a very significant improvement in um, in the quality of, uh, of the soil and the crops. So this is the uh, Western Australia and other project, Mali tree project. So what we see here is what was uh, historically a, um, um, a subtropical rainforest. Now it's, it was removed, so it's, so it's converted to agricultural land for growth of, um, of uh, wheat. And now we see that it was the water table rose and the, the soil is heavily affected by salinity and the quality of the soil declined. So what was the solution? Was to grow back the trees, the mali trees, and then the, which their roots can lower the water table uh, read, with time, improve the quality of the soil or, or, or um, reduce the soil salinity, while the wheat we see on the sides grows consistently or in, inside, or on, uh, on the side with the mali trees. And then the forestry residues of the mali trees is uh, used for biomass. So this is another sustainable way of producing the biomass. Another one is we're looking at a lead um, and zinc smelter and soil, we looked at soil contaminated from lead and zinc smelter. Um, this was uh, north from, from Sydney and an area where there was um, a very significant, significant impact from uh, the lead and zinc smelter with increased uh, blood level of lead in the children. So uh, this uh, the this is coming from the um, the slag that is is pretty much found everywhere in around this area. So what we looked at is um, an um, a crop or, or a, a plant that can be used for fetal remediation that uh, will. Uh, improve the quality or remediate the soil, and then we can harvest the plant. And what we do, we use with the plant. So can we actually produce fuels and make the plant useful? So um, we have a number of winning solutions here. And what we found is that there are some, um, some elements such as cadmium and lead that are volatile, but some elements that are, um, can we can found in the in the biochar, um, and uh, so we need some further studies just to make sure that the cadmium and lead can be trapped in the particles. But it shows promising results uh, combining fetal remediation with um, with uh, a bio biofuel production. Algal biomass has also been. Um, 
has been proposed where we see a power station with CO2 of gas. We see ponds with algae here. So the CO2 the idea is to bubble the CO2 in the ponds, use the CO2 to grow the algae, and then use the algae to produce biofuels. And we um, we did produce biofuels from uh, biomass, uh, from um, algae, and uh, designed a way that we can maximize the use of the bio oils because the liquids in in case of the algae is the most uh, the most important product. So we found a way through um, lipid extraction and pyrolysis to get sixty three almost percent of the liquids. <clears throat> And um, the, the last way of what we propose, um, and this is the future direction, is uh, harvesting of bio of forests um, in a way which is, what is called um, thinning of the forest in a way that we prevent uh, fires. We bushfires are very um, big problem here in Australia. Uh, the 2019, the famous Australian Sydney bushfires which theoretically, if we have converted all the biomass lost in the bushfires as electricity, we in just um, we lost it in a week week's time, uh, it would have been enough to produce almost um, electricity for uh, to cover all of the Australian electricity in that year alone. And this is a thirty percent um, electricity conversion. So, this is the future, um, again, of, of potentially biomass um, uh, supply. Okay, in conclusion, um, biomass is the largest renewable energy source with over 10% contribution to the global energy supply. Uh, sustainability can be, can range from very unsustainable to very sustainable, uh, depending on the supply of, of biomass. So there are uh, potentially engineering solutions and design of system solution that biomass uh, production can be linked to solving other environmental problems such as soil salinity, fertility, carbon sequestration, uh, soil or groundwater remediation, as well as, as fire management. So I think I'm um, up to my time here. So um, that's pretty much our presentation on the uh, on the biomass and bioenergy. Okay, thanks for the excellent presentation of Vladimir. And here's a question from the Professor Liu Guorui. And he asked, besides the heavy metals, zinc and lead smelt also release polyaromatic uh, hydrocarbons and dioxins. Did any techniques could be used for the remediation of the uh, pH, you know, or dioxin contaminant com contaminations. Very good, uh, very good <laughs> comment. Uh, we have, we, I have different projects on the dioxins and PAHs that are very difficult to deal with. Um, we have not <clears throat> looked at plants that can deal, that can break down the dioxins and the PAHs simply because they are so stable once they are released. So. Uh, Interesting comment. I uh, absolutely agree that there would be dioxins there. Uh, just from the because they're so expensive to measure, and that's what we found with the with the project we have. We haven't looked at the dioxins in this specific uh, uh, site area. Okay, thanks for your answer. And uh, I also have a question. Uh, we all, we know that in China, the biomass per pyrolysis is decreasing and even exceed. from your presentation we know that the bio biomass pyrolysis can keep the soil fertile and uh, what do you think uh, what we should do to uh, use the biomass pyrolysis to convert to the electricity or what the government should do so um, biomass pyrolysis is still from the technology point of view and the economics is still not there. The moment it is gasification, biomass gasification that is uh, is available, 
So I think China is doing well with the biomass gasification. So by the time the pyrolysis units become um, uh, become efficient and uh, inexpensive, I would say uh, keep continue using the gasification. Uh, there's still some uh, residue left that you can use for for the same types of purposes. So um, and uh, get get the research going in the pyrolysis and help us. Uh, improve this technology. Okay, thanks for your answer. And uh, <laughs> if if any anyone have any questions, uh, we can chat in the uh, chat room to ask Professor Vlad Vladimir. Okay, thanks for your presentation. Thank you.